I want to do now is to just tidy up a few small packages um, just an example of other packages to uh, build just little tools so the first one I'm going to do is smart mon tools which is a useful tool for monitoring the smart status on hard disks So again, we've got all of the dependencies. So let's download this. So there's no extra configurations. Um, it's not one, just one explanation. So we'll just build it with the instructions given. And install it. And optionally, there's a boot script so that um, you can have it monitoring the disks all the time. You can even configure it to send an email when there's um, certain conditions um, detected, such as you know in, uh, impending failure or, or uh, warnings in the status. So let's do that. And start it off. And basically, you've got something called Smart CTL, and you can examine um, disk information. Um, and it looks like it's only a root program. So, so you can see it's all the information about the hard disk, all the critical vital, vital statistics, um, and then there's some start the data, and then there's actual what I call really useful stuff: how many sectors have been reallocated, how long the hard disk has been on for, how many times it's been powered on, etc. How many errors have been recovered, and so on. Um, look at sometimes, sometime recently, it's been tested a few times and it's been aborted, so maybe that's Windows doing that, possibly. Um, looks like that's probably been done at the factory and then. This is a little bit more recently. Uh, looks like the last time it ran, it was it was interrupted, so it's probably power down. Um, and if you do smart control with the next, you get a lot more information. So similar stuff there. You get a lot more information here. And there's more information about the temperature of the drive, so the current temperature is 29. It's got a maximum limit of 70 degrees Celsius. And then there's a temperature history chart here. And some more information down the bottom here. So that's Smart One Tools. I'll knock that one off. Chapter 5. Um, 
um, next one I'm going to do is actually part of KDE. It's a text editor called Kate. Um, so, because I've installed um, KDE, I mean you don't need KDE, but because I've installed it, make it make the installation a bit more complete. Uh, I'll install it here in the section six. They've put it, even though it's part of KDE, they've put it separately as, as uh, just an ordinary editor that anything could use, any uh, desktop environment. Kate K Advanced Text Editor. So there's no other extra options, we'll just copy and paste. These are nice and simple. Okay, so that's built. Um, it should be when I've installed it. It should be in the menu. Uh, if I pick up the right mouse. Yeah, there it is. Uh, So it's a little bit more than a plain text editor. Um, it's it's pretty good actually. Um, as you can see, it's tabbed. It will load code and highlight it and so on. Um, there's probably a lot more that it does as well that I don't know about. Um, but it's a handy text editor to have. Um, let's see if we can load up. Some, oops, yeah, there's some source you can see. Oh, it's a diff file, it's a patch file. You can see it's highlighting it. Um, so let's look at C file. You can see it's highlighted it. So it's um, a step up from a basic text editor. So that's Kate. Um, I'm not going to go through and install all of the text editors, but um, I'm just going to take a look at Vim to see what differences, if any, there are. Oh, yes, it's to install a graphical front end to it. So I will install this. So let's save this.
So there's a warning there if you haven't got your X libraries on the root partition. So if you partitioned your drive up a little bit differently, um, to warn that that those libraries may not be there if uh, you need to gain access to Vim in an emergency. So let's extract the package. So at the moment, if I type in Vi, we can run it, but it will run in a console. In fact, it's not run at all. It may have just run it in the background, possibly. Um, it obviously knows uh, the way it rendered the icon there. It knows it's a command tool, so it's trying to run it from the um, well, the command line, if you like, but it's probably running it in the background. So because there's nothing coming up on the screen. It's probably just running it and it's just not doing anything else. So let's um, run this in. Let's see what other options we've got. So we want to enable the GUI, so we'll keep the GTK3 option. Um, and we can enable these interpreters as well actually so let's do these two echoes and copy this and add in these four options for additional interpreters and just remove the commas out of that list So it's Perl, Python, TCL and Ruby, we've got all those interpreters, all those languages, so there's no reason why it shouldn't work. Okay, so now we can do make. Let's make test. It says to redirect the output to a log file because it can mess up the settings of the current terminal. So let's do something like that. Make sure the file doesn't exist by tapping it. No, it doesn't. Looks like it's failed. Let's have a look at the log. Right, looks like it might have caused the problem with the terminal as it is. Um, let's do a reset. Oh, so it does look like it finished, it just ejected the error at the end. Yeah. Okay, I think that's okay. You can see it actually left the test directory, so it had had finished. So let's install it. And there's some changes here. So for documentation. Should I update the runtime files issue the following commands. So I imagine this is going to go and fetch something. Uh, 
and then install these new runtime files. And that's done. And desktop entry can be created. Integrated spell checker you can enable. It says they can find out what's new in the current version. So let's see if we can run this now. So yeah, we've got this new icon here, Vim, text editor. And there it is, it's actually opened up this time. And we've got menus here that work within this terminal. So let's quit that. Um, you can see there's GVIM, I think, is the one we just run. So if we try that here. Oh, right, no, it wasn't. I beg your pardon. This is the graphical front end. So the other one must have been a terminal with Vi. Yeah, that's strange why it ran the, the terminal before. But this is a fully um, graphical interface here. With, yeah, that's better. I thought the options didn't look like there was enough of them there. And they look similar to the console. But this is a proper um, Vim with um, all the graphical menus available. So it might be easier to use in the actual command prompt version. Um, so that's Vim reloaded with the graphical front end. So let's tidy that up. And the next one I'm going to install is something that can be quite useful is LSOF. If you're not used this for what it's useful for is um, if you've got like a a um, if you've got like a USB drive you're trying to unmount, there's a file still open and you can't find why that is or what file or what program's holding that file open. This this program will um, show you what. Um, programs and process IDs have uh, got access to that file so it can be quite a useful little tool to have LSOF list open files um, contents include another tool type of order, which includes the source code so it needs to be uninstalled or unpacked as well so let's just copy this and build it there's no test suite so let's install it and there's a manual here as well so if for example I go into this window and um, for example, I open that Cindy file. If I do ls of on Cindy. Uh, All right, we're not. Uh, maybe that's because the copy's been created while it's um, editing it. Um, how can I emulate this now? Okay, I know what I can do. If I write some zeros to a file. 
and in the background and then so if you can see there it's telling me the command that's using this file that's got this file open here that's the name of the file the PID and the user so if, it, if you're on a shared system and it's your mate your colleague you can say to him you know can you release that file or if it's on a single system you know it's only yourself you can try and kill the PID so I could try doing 15542 and it actually respected that if it was a runaway um, program that was misbehaving it might not acknowledge that so you'd have to kill it with minus nine um, but yeah if I didn't know what program it was you can see how, how useful it is so if I rerun LSOF obviously it's not there anymore because the process has been killed that was using it but of course the file's still there you can see it's written 24 megabytes in that time so yeah that like I say that's quite a useful little tool to have at times so that's LSOF chapter 11 So the next tool I'm going to install is one called Screen, and this is just basically a multiplexer. Oops, um, and it allows you to control several several sessions from one um, login session, if you like. Um, and it's useful if you're accessing remote machines from a single terminal. You can switch between each of those um, sessions. You've got access to those different machines and um, just do that for one terminal um, if I download and compile it I can give a quick demo if you've never seen it before and it might, might make more sense what I'm saying um, so let's see what options we've got here I was just warning you there if you're installing this newer version of screen on an older version of LFS that the uh, group options change to PTY group. Apart from that, there's no other changes. So make install. And that should be it. So there is a configuration file, but I, I don't have a find the need for that but basically what we can do is you can start the screen session off simple as this um, and it tells you um, what you've got there so it looks like it all it's done is clear to screen but you can see at the top of the console it's, it is, it is actually running program screen and what I could do for example is put top in here have that running and what I need to do next is do control A which allows you to access a menu that's hidden and just press D after you've pressed control A and what that's done is, is detach the session so if I now do screen minus L no that's not right is it screen minus LS yeah that's it it shows that there's one screen session running and it, it will still be running in the background as well and that's the process idea of it and you can see it's running on the pseudo terminal 2 so I can now start off another screen and I could do something like ls minus lr on the root and I can do control a and then d detach that when I do screen you can see there's two sessions running now to get back to one of them I just type minus R 
I think that does the most recent one. No, you've got to tell it. That's right, because it's, it's ambiguous. So if I do the earlier one, one seven two five seven. Sorry, that was the most recent one. But you can see it was still running in the background. And it's actually completed. Uh, so if I run that again, do Control Alt D, go to the other one. Sorry, it has got the low number. You can see that's still running in the background. Alt D again. Or control A D, go back to the other one, you can see that's finished. So you can see that you can run a program inside a screen session, detach it, turn off the computer you're on, leaving the screen logging everything on the remote machine, and then when you come back to it, you can restore it and um, you'll get the results or you can see it just running. So it is it's quite useful. Um, and in fact, to prove how it works, if I, you can even do things like pick up sessions. Yeah, I'm attached to this one at the moment. So this was the one that was running less. So if I do this in a continuous loop, um, well, true, if I can remember the syntax for this. that and then that no um no I can't remember how to use the wall come on now um let's try Yeah, that should run around a thousand times. So I can do Control Alt D, Control A, sorry, and then D. Screen minus LS to show the sessions. Now, as so I could power down this machine, I don't want to do that because it's obviously running on this machine. But imagine that was a remote machine I was running on. I could go back to my machine or another machine, a third machine, and. Actually, attach the session so for the screen minus R on 7224. I'll get the session back so you can see that it's quite useful um, with SSH to actually log into a remote machine, shut down this session, then come back the next day and load up the session. So um, I'll close this down. Those screens are still running in the background. Oh, in fact, I closed it down on the other terminal. That's right. Sorry, on on, on this terminal because I'm still logged into. It. So if I exit that now, um, there's the one. I can I can just do screen minus R this time. I don't need to specify the. Um, PID because it is the only one, and uh, there is a session of the Control Alt, Control A, and then D again. It shuts down that screen session, and I could pick that one up from another terminal once I'd logged into this remote machine. Um, as you can see, it's it's not showing screen anymore. It's totally detached. That screen session's running effectively on the remote machine. So. All I need to do to close that session down is to recall it and do Control D. And you can see it says screen is terminating, and I can do Control D and close this local copy. So that I hope that explains it quite well. So that's screen done, and that's in eleven as well. Right, the next one I want to do is GParted. 
which is a graphical front end to um, parted. So let's save this. Slowly, yeah. Okay. So some options here. Uh, let's get rid of the disabled dock. I think we've got. Oops. I think we've got the known dock utils. I don't think we're actually running on the Wayland, so we don't need that other option. Let's make We'll test it. Okay, we've got one failure. Um, So we can, it's probably a file system, and I didn't tell us how to support file system. So yeah, it's probably one file system that we haven't got support for. So we'll just look at the test log. Didn't specifically say anything. Um, what we can do is we can install it and just rerun it in case it, um, in case it needs something installed. So let's just run there. Sorry, not install. So he tests again. No, it's failed in the same way. Okay. Um, as it says down here, the only one we haven't got this is JFS utils. Um, and you can see it needs kernel swap. I've never used this. In fact, I'm not really sure I've even heard of it. So I don't know if it's. Oh, yes, it's a journaling file system, isn't it? Yes, I've heard of this one. Um, so, yeah, I've never used it. I'm not particularly bothered about installing this, um, especially at this point. So that could be right why it's um, not uh, working. Um, if we wish to run the application from the menu, uh, further applications and configurations are necessary. So it needs SSH ask pass, so let's install that. Um, and see if we can actually get it running from the menu. Um, I imagine. Oh, hang on a minute. Is that part of. Oh, it's part of OpenSSH. 
Uh, let's just see if we can run it from the command line. It needs the root password. To run it as the root, okay. Yeah, okay, it's run straight away, so. So as you can see, we've got a picture of our disk and the partitions it's split up into. Um, and then they're also listed here below. And you'll notice a little padlock here. These are the ones that are, are, are mounted and in use, so we can't edit those ones. But for example, we could resize the Windows partition if we wanted to. Um, and there's a Dell support partition there hidden. In fact, there's three hidden partitions there. They're obviously um, for recovery, recovery partitions. Um, but yeah, it's just the same as any other type of partition manager. It's got all the options. In fact, arguably it does more because it does lots of different um, Linux partitions. So, for example, we could create, I don't know if we can, yeah, new, create a new partition here. And you can see there's all the file systems there. So the ones that are greyed out, you probably can't find support for either in the kernel or binaries. Although I haven't said that, I'm sure we did the resurface. There's that JFS. So it could be the other dependencies, the reason why that's not coming up. But let's um, try and install, I'll type this in here. I imagine it's going to ask us about the password again, yeah. So let's try and install this ask pass. So it looks like that's all it is. Let's install it. And this configuration to set in sudo.conf. If a given graphical application requires administrative privileges, use sudo minus a application from the next terminal. Okay, so this means we should be around, allowed to run it with that. Without, oops, without becoming root. So let's try that again, but not as root. Yes, it's worked. So that's, that's good. Um, so from here, if this still asks, yeah, let's try and put, let's put our own password in to start off with, see if the sudo works. No, let's try the root password. No. So what we'd need to do here is to find the gparted menu option, right click and do edit. Uh, application and here we put the command is sudo minus capital A and now it should run all oh, right it's actually asking us the password so that's fine it's probably because we had the sudo active on the terminal, which is why it didn't ask us before. But you can see it's run without us needing to know the root password. So it makes it a little bit more secure. So that's that. Uh, let me mark off that SSH one. Ask pass and gparted as well, which is under section 41. So there are a few other 
applications that I've not gone through. In fact, there's a um, like a messenger application called Pigeon, um, which I'm not going to do. Hex Chat, I'm not sure what that is. I imagine it's another sort of. Um, Um, messaging, yeah, oh, I was an IRC client, okay. So, the basically, things that you know I'd never use myself, so that's really why I'm not installing them. Um, but as you can see, these other little tools are, are fairly straightforward, there's nothing particularly complicated about them. Um, I'm going to do one other application which is transmission. Um, it's quite a nice um, BitTorrent client, so if you ever need to like download distros or anything that are on BitTorrent, it's uh, quite a nice utility to have. So we can do... Okay, the switch disables building of the GTK, GTK Plus interface. If GTK Plus is present on the system, useful for QT5 or CLI only builds. Um, so let's actually do a help. So if we need to enable the QT, because um, if that if that's the case, that's what we're using here. So we may as well make use of the QT system. Uh, grip. No, there isn't any option, so all we need to do is just disable it then. Without GTK and without so many minuses. So you can see it's got GTK plus client no. It's got lib app indicator but we haven't that hasn't got that as a dependency. Um let's see if we can enable that because we have got that installed. Maybe there isn't a switch for it then. Or maybe it's GTK only. Yeah maybe there's something to do with GTK. Okay, so let's build this now. So imagine from what this says here, by just doing the make, we've built a command line only version, because it says here, the Qt GUI version, you need to run these commands. Actually, looks like it creates a separate binary for each type of interface. So, what I will do is actually install both of them and we can just compare them side by side. So, I won't run without uh, this without the without GTK option, i.e., I'll leave GTK in. So it'll take a little bit longer to build this time. And now let's build the QT interface. Done so let's install and 
and we need to install the Qt GUI as well. And that's done. So let's see if this is in the menu. So we've got transmission, so this will be the GTK version. And let's load the QT version. And it looks like it's slightly different. But you can see there's not a lot in it actually. Perhaps the only difference is the QT1 search box is as long as the window is wide. Um, the rendering of the drop down list is slightly different. It's slightly larger on the GTK one, so the QT is more compact. Apart from that, there's not a lot of visual difference. So there's the GTK version and there's the QT version. So even the help looks a little bit different. So yep, that's a BitTorrent client. Um, where is that one? It's 41 as well. So the last application I'm going to install from the BLFS book is a screensaver, X screensaver. Uh, there's loads of really good screensavers on this. You'll want to install this just because the screensavers, some of them look really, really cool, really clever. Um, so let's download this. We've got a few fixes to do. And if we go into the source, and let's put in the set UID hacks option. To the configure makes one of the screen savers a little bit more um, interesting. So let's build this. and install it and we've got a PAM configuration file that's needed here as well and that's done um, see if we can actually get to this from the system settings in KDE. Um, if you have trouble getting it going you can type X screensaver X screensaver and then you can go to settings from here um, but should be able to find it in here not with the X, just the screen saver. Display configuration. No. Locking. Right, 
I thought screensaver attached itself to the settings here. Maybe I'm wrong. ticks there for there's no message next to it okay let's let's use the screen saver um, option so well anyway you can see there's a demo window here and you've basically got I don't know maybe a hundred or so different screen savers. Some are unticked. I think that's because they're either experimental or, or there may some, be some interaction with the graphics subsystem doesn't work. Um, but you will find some won't render. But you can see there's quite a lot of uh, different interesting screen savers. Yeah, I could quite easily sit here for a while just playing with them um, and you've got settings as well for each of them um, so that they're all quite quite highly configurable so I can make this run a little bit faster change the size of the hex guns six the lines Speed they move out if they spin. Wireframe, frame show the frame rate even, um, and then you can actually preview it as it would be. So yeah, it's quite quite mesmerising on some fractals and so on. So that's the screen saver. Oh, what's this advanced tab? Alright, oh, okay, it's just more configuration. Let me start demon. Okay, so it looks like once it's run, it runs in the background, so I'll put that in the background. And in theory, if I was to leave this, it should come into action. Um, so that was the last package I wanted to show. Um, actually, there wasn't any more configuration there, was there? No. Um, so the only other thing I'm going to do in another video is to install a package that's not in BLFS at all. It's not even got a mention, and all it is is a game. It's um, it's a fairly good game, it's called Wes North, I'll show that it's not in here, uh, certainly not in the index. Um, and it's good because it uses a few libraries. Um, up to now I think I've always had to download an extra library, I can't remember which one, but I have a feeling from what I've seen the libraries have installed this time, might not have to, might just be the program, but um, I'm just going to install it or demonstrate it being installed as an example of how you can just fetch any package you know you might see a package in another distribution like Ubuntu or Debian or something I think oh, I wish I had that on my Linux from scratch system well assuming it's open source and the uh, source is available for downloading I'll show you as an example this program how you can fetch the source just read the instructions on how to install it, install it and get it working.